Okay, we'll wait another uh, couple of minutes. Are, are you, um, where are you geographically right now, Cynthia? I'm in Boston. Yeah, yeah, over, yeah. over at Longwood or? Uh, yeah, in Fenway, close okay. to it, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So we're a half mile apart. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> yeah. Are you in Palo Alto, Santiago? Yeah, I am. Yeah, uh, our apartment is in downtown Palo Alto. That's nice. Not much of a downtown compared to Boston, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least you probably have better weather. <laughs> during At the times. Yeah, yeah, during the winter, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the the I'm not. I think the other people can hear us. So I'm I'm I'll. Uh, uh, but um, twenty minute talks plus uh, I think ten minutes of Q and A. That's my understanding. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm waiting until noon sharp, and uh, when when noon sharp gets here, I'm going to start us off. And of course, this will be the longest minute of our day because I, I, it's 11.59. Your screen sharing is, is good, Cynthia? Yeah, it's working. Okay, terrific. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is John White. I'm, uh, e I'm talking to you from Boston University, where I'm the chair of the biomedical engineering department. And I'm also the president of the Biomedical Engineering Society. So I'm really delighted to, with this new event that we're kicking off today. And it's really, it, it's an event that we owe a lot of thanks to some great people, including today's speakers and all the speakers to come but also to the BME Unite group, which has, which organized, self-organized this, put it all together, and the, and the BMES uh, staff who uh, helped uh, with the uh, logistics for this terrific event. I, I think this is gonna be great. It's gonna be the highlight of my day today, and I think the highlight of many Mondays to come. Uh, so I will start by introducing our first speaker today. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Cynthia Hajal, uh, Cynthia went to Columbia for her understudies, where she took on the remarkable uh, task of double majoring in mechanical engineering and economics. That's not something you see very often. Uh, she received her PhD in mechanical engineering at MIT, working with Roger Cam on brain on a chip technologies for studying tumor progression, which I believe is what she's going to focus on today. Uh, she just started fairly recently as a postdoc at Dana-Farber here in Boston. Uh, working with Keith Ligon, and she, so she's furthering her studies, uh, uh, no doubt, for treatments of cancer, the number one, the number two killer in the United States. So Cynthia's got a great record. She's published a number of papers in journals like PNES, Nature Materials, Nature Communications, Biology, Biomaterials. Uh, her, has, she has a number of awards, including the Ludwig Center Graduate Fellowship, the MIT Mechanical Engineering Research Symposium Pre Presentation Award, and the Meredith Cam. Memorial Award for Excellence, also at MIT. So Cynthia, I'll turn the, ta the um, platform over to you and let's give Cynthia a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen in presentation mode? Perfect. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today and share some of my work on engineering a brain on a chip model to study tumor progression. So I'll first give a little bit of background on my scientific journey, then I'll delve into the research and some of my vision and future goals for my lab. So I was born in France to immigrant parents who fled Lebanon during the civil war. And by age 11, things had calmed down in Lebanon. So we moved back there and I completed my high school in Lebanon. 
Then when I was 18, I came to the US for undergrad and I studied economics and mechanical engineering economics because I had an interest in understanding how inequalities arise in different countries and mechanical engineering because I like the multidisciplinary research projects associated with this major, as well as the fact that it uh, taught me some of the fundamentals of engineering. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I did research in the labs of James Hone and Michael Sheets, and that experience really confirmed my desire to pursue a career in academia. And so for my PhD training, I studied mechanical engineering at MIT and worked in the lab of Roger Cam at the intersection in microfluidics, tissue engineering, and cancer. And my ultimate goal was to kind of design systems that can have a meaningful impact in patients' lives. And so now as a postdoc in the lab of Keith Ligon at Dana-Farber, I'm working on brain tumor patient models and trying to understand how patients develop resistance to chemotherapies and the role of the brain microenvironment in resistance. And outside of research, I enjoy running, cooking, and painting. And so getting into some of uh, my research projects, since I'll be talking a lot about brain on a chip models, I thought I would start by giving some background on the blood brain barrier. So the blood brain barrier is the interface between blood circulation and brain parenchyma, and it's composed of endothelial cells that line the blood vessels, pericytes encased in basement membrane for stromal cell support, and astrocytes that extend their end feet to touch the abluminal side of the vessel. And when we compare general capillaries to BBB capillaries, there are a few distinctive features that are uh, quite important. Notably, the endothelial cell fenestra in BBB capillaries is significantly smaller than general capillaries. And the organization of the three cell types of the BBB results in increased junction protein expression and reduced transport at the brain. So the BBB is actually a highly selective and restrictive endothelium. Looking at brain cancer, um, brain metastases are actually quite common in cancer patients, with about a fifth of cancer patients developing these throughout the course of their cancer progression. Primary brain tumors are less common. Nonetheless, they're actually quite aggressive with uh, high-grade gliomas being the most common primary brain tumors, also called glioblastoma. And for all types of brain cancers, prognosis tends to be very poor with very low five-year survival rates. And that actually stems from the very uh, deep interactions between vasculature and tumors at the brain. When we look at metastatic brain cancers, these originate from primary brain tumors with tumor cells detaching and entering the circulation where they travel and are able to leave the vessels at the brain in a process called extravasation to form secondary tumors. And in primary brain cancers, these typically emerge from non-malignant cells of the brain that undergo mutations and become malignant. And these tumors tend to co-opt the vasculature and live very closely to the blood vessels where they can benefit from significant nutrient and gas exchanges. And so as a result of these interactions, there are um, very often residual tumors left after surgery because of how uh, closely intertwined the tumors are with the healthy brain microenvironment. And because of the selective BBB, therapeutic transport is quite challenging. And as a result, most patients develop resistance to their chemotherapies, and that's the main culprit in a patient outcomes. So to be able to understand these interactions and use systems and design systems that can uh, be useful for uh, patient care, we wanted to engineer brain on a chip systems to study cancer. And these brain models need to first recapitulate the natural BBB in vitro, and then they can be used for cancer cell extravasation studies and also to study uh, primary brain tumor BBB interactions for the delivery of targeted therapies. And so looking first at recapitulating the natural BBB in vitro, um, to, in order to do this, we use the three cell types of the BBB, endothelial cells, pericytes, and astrocytes that are combined in a fibrinogen thrombin gel and injected in the central gel channel of microfluidic devices. And after seven days of culture, these uh, cells are able to self-assemble into perfusible 3D structures that can then be used for a variety of assays. 
So we first looked at important BBB features that uh, we wanted to compare to in vivo brain capillaries. And looking first at the 3D cellular organization of these systems, we found that the three cell types adopted their appropriate morphology in the 3D space around the vasculature. And looking at uh, some of the parameters of the vessels, we found that there was increased branching in these in vitro structures with small diameters comparable to those found in vivo. We then also quantified paracellular permeability to a variety of solutes of different sizes and found that these permeabilities were quite low and comparable to those found in vivo. More importantly, we wanted to investigate the protein and gene expression profiles of these BBB vessels, and we found that junctional and transporter proteins were expressed in these systems and that there was deposition of basement membrane around the vasculature. And by isolating the endothelial cells of the microfluidic devices and quantifying their gene expression for junctional proteins and transporter receptors, we found that the expression of the endothelial cells was comparable to that of primary brain endothelial cells. So having designed these models, we wanted to then use them for cancer studies, looking first at cancer extravasation and brain metastases. And so to be able to understand the role of the microenvironment in brain metastases, we uh, subsequently added the different brain stromal cells in our platform, starting from a monoculture of endothelial cells all the way up to our triculture of pericytes and astrocytes. And what we found was that by perfusing tumor cells and looking at their extravasation, their extravasation potential was always increased in the triculture system. So we wanted to understand why that was the case. And so to do this, we removed the pericytes and astrocytes from the platform, by treated, but treated the monoculture endothelium with conditioned media from pericytes and astrocytes. And we found that uh, the treated endothelium had increased extravasation of tumor cells. And so looking more closely at the secretion profiles of pericytes and astrocytes, a few cytokines were found to be upregulated in these systems. And so by blocking these cytokines, we found that only the blocking of CCL2 was able to reduce extravasation. And we further confirmed that CCL2 is primarily secreted by astrocytes. So by blocking um, and knocking down CCL2 in astrocytes prior to microvascular network formation, we found that extravasation was reduced. We then wanted to look at the receptors for CCL2, and these are CCR2 and CCR4. And by blocking these receptors on the tumor cells, we found that only the blocking of CCR2 was able to reduce extravasation, which confirmed that there are interactions between astrocytes and tumor cells with the CCL2-CCR2 pathway. By looking more closely at these interactions with high spatial temporal resolution, we found that blocking the CCL2 CCR2 axis reduced the interactions between tumor cells and astrocytes, but more importantly, reduced the speed of tumor cells before and after extravasation, which led us to conclude that CCL2 from astrocyte also has a chemokinetic role on the tumor cells. We finally wanted to validate some of these results in vivo with intracardiac injection of CCR2 deficient tumor cells, and we found that indeed their extravasation is reduced compared to control cells. We also wanted to be able to investigate interactions of the BBB with primary brain tumors. And so Briefly to reiterate, chemotherapeutic administration in patients is typically non-targeted. As a result of this, patients are often left with residual tumors. The maximum dose of chemotherapy is often capped due to side effects. And because of repeated cycles with long intervals, patients end up acquiring resistance to their chemotherapies because of the emergence of subclones that have mutations on a uh, that are resistant to these chemotherapies. So this goes to say that there really is a need to design alternative treatments for these primary brain tumors. So to be able to address these questions, we used similar systems as the one described earlier with endothelial cells, parasites, and astrocytes, but we now incorporated a primary brain tumor into these microfluidic systems. 
And what we first found was that as the primary brain tumor and uh, cells in the surrounding matrix were growing in conjunction, the vascular structures that were developed exhibited a lot of co-option from the tumor cells with um, stabilized vessel densities in the areas of co-option. And so we wanted to characterize our platform in terms of its paracellular permeability to low molecular weight solutes. And so we did this by investigating permeability near the tumor spheroid and far away from it. And what we found was that there were actually no differences in permeability. And that's actually fairly common in patients where parts of their brain tumors will exhibit an intact BBB in terms of paracellular permeability. And it's actually quite common in uh, residual tumors post-surgery. So having validated this, we wanted to see if there were actual changes in the expression of transporter receptors in our system. And so we investigated the expression of low density lipoprotein related protein one, which is a lipid transporter at the brain also called LRP1. And we found that this, its expression was increased near the glioma compared to far away. And so we collaborated with Paula Hammond's group and my collaborator Joelle Straela designed these nanoparticles that have ligands called angiopep2 that target LRP1 at the brain. And so we investigated first the permeability of these nanoparticles in the different formulations. And what we found was that the particles with angiopep2 coating had increased permeability near the tumor spheroid compared to far away from it, and also compared to the other nanoparticle formulations. Also, we found that these nanoparticles had improved uptake by the glioma tumor spheroid beyond the barrier of the BBB. And by blocking LRP1, we validated that permeability of these nanoparticles was reduced, uh, confirming that they crossed the BBB via LRP1-mediated transport. And so to delve into the functional goal of our study, we wanted to see whether we could design targeted therapies for these tumors. And so we used uh, chemotherapy cisplatin and encapsulated it in the nanoparticles that have the targeting ligands for uh, LRP1. And we found that for both free cisplatin and the targeting ligand, the tumor size was reduced over time. But importantly for the angiopep2 particle, the killing was more observed inside the tumor as opposed to all throughout the device, which confirmed the selective ability to target the tumor spheroid. And we also validated this via PCR by observing increased expression of cell death marker inside the tumor spheroid when we treated the devices with the angiopep2 particles. And so I'll just go into some of my future goals and how this all relates to what I would want to do in my future lab. So to briefly go back to standard of cares for brain tumor patients, um, these patients typically receive surgery, followed by radiation and temozolomide as standard of care chemotherapy. But most patients typically um, exhibit a recurrence of their tumor in either the same or a different location of the brain. And that has been evidenced in the past to, to be caused by mutations in mismatch repair genes. And so once patients uh, acquire these resistance as uh, evidence through sequencing of biopsies after the second surgery, they are given alternative chemotherapies that target the tumor in a different manner with different DNA damaging properties. What is also known about resistant brain tumors is that they exhibit altered expression of BBB transporter. And in fact, several efflux pumps at the BBB are actually substrates for these chemotherapies. So the BBB and brain microenvironment is actually often overlooked in drug studies and in patient care, but it's actually quite crucial. And so our future goal would be to design in vitro BBB tumor models to study differential trafficking of chemotherapies. And so we can do this similarly as described earlier with human cells, but also with isolation of patient cells to create more personalized model with tumor cells and endothelial cells from patients. And then we could perform functional assays to study the gene and expression profiles of these and endothelium near and far away from the tumor for systematic characterization 
information of what genes are overexpressed and what targets can be employed in the design of therapies. On the other hand, um, chemo-resistant models are very often overlooked when designing these strategies, and there are very few uh, groups working on understanding how the endothelium changes when tumors become resistant to their chemotherapies. So our goal would also be to use these systems to uh, incorporate patient samples from surgeries after chemo-resistant to study how the endothelium has changed after acquisition of resistance. The other goal would be, and it's something that I'm working on now in the Ligon lab, is to engineer these 3D tumor spheroids to acquire resistance to chemotherapies in vitro and be able to study their interactions with a brain microenvironment. And so none of this work would have been possible without my mentors, Roger, Cam, and Keith Ligon, as well as my peers and the Cam and Ligon lab members. I also really want to thank my collaborators, Leanne Lee and Tyler Jack's lab, and Joelle Strella and Hannah Safford and Paula Hammond's lab, as well as the sources of funding. And so to briefly conclude, um, our goal is to engineer brain on a chip models that can recapitulate important features of the natural BBB so that we can use these systems to study cancer progression, both in terms of metastatic cancer and primary cancer with the goal of uh, designing uh, therapeutics that can be uh, delivered in a more targeted manner. And finally, we, we want to do in the future is to design BBB tumor models of chemo resistance where changes in the endothelium can be captured in a more targeted manner so that we can design therapies. And so thank you very much for your time. I'm going to leave my conclusion slides in case there are any questions. And thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Cynthia. That was terrific. And we've uh, already got uh, some, some good questions. Uh, I don't know that you can see the questions, so I will. Uh, can you see the questions? I think I can. I okay. see some in the Q and A. Yes, yes, uh, there are some in the Q and A. So I'll I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and read them so that you don't have to. Uh, so uh, we'll start at the top. So outside of glioma, do carcinomas like melanoma and breast cancer that metastasize to the brain also co-opt vessels in the brain post extravasation? I'm wondering how generalizable your model is to. Uh, other kinds of cancers. Yeah, that's a great point. And they actually do. And it's a very typical feature of primary and metastatic brain tumors. And there's actually a very nice paper by the Winkler group. Uh, the first author his last name is Kinast in Nature Medicine, I believe, that really investigates with uh, uh, photon imaging or intravital imaging how co-option arises in metastatic tumors. And yeah, that happens with melanoma, breast cancer, also lung cancer. So yeah, it is very common. Terrific. I'm going to I'm going to uh, take the uh, the opportunity to burst in with my own uh, yeah. question. And so I, my understanding is that one of the killer one, one of the really hard problems about glioblastoma is that it's very prone to these uh, distant metastasizations within the brain. And so how would you and, and and meanwhile it's becoming chemo chemo resistant, right? So it's such a such a hard hard problem. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of outline to me your uh, the strategy that you're going to use to sort of take care of these these little pockets that are hiding out in the brain and and evolving into chemical resistance? Yeah, so that's a really good point. So yeah, typically these occur from either tumors that have moved around the brain or chemotherapy uh, that just like makes the tumors like kind of invisible to the whatever treatment they are receiving because they're hiding either behind the blood brain barrier or are in very distant areas where like the treatment is not reaching. So our system is, I would say more for the evaluation of residual tumors or smaller tumors that can hide behind the microvasculature. And so to be able to target these um, usually with surgery the bulk of the tumor is removed. And so the ones that are hiding are typically not removed. And so we could recapitulate heterogeneity in our system by investigating different like 
tumors that have different mutational signatures by incorporating those into the system. But because there very little is known about the tumors that are far away from the bulk of the tumor that is removed during surgery, then yeah, it, it might be difficult to get those from patients. But it would be easy to use genetic engineering tools to kind of recapitulate the molecular features of these tumors if we knew what they actually looked like. But yeah, the system is more for, I guess, smaller residual tumors to investigate interactions with the BBP. I see. I see. Great answer. Okay. Uh, back to the written questions. Yeah. Did you explore the activation state of astrocytes during extravasation? Yeah, that is a great point. And so we haven't, but yeah, it is a bit unclear. Like by activation site, a lot of people refer to, for example, like GFAP uh, expression or other types of metrics. Um, but yeah, we haven't specifically looked at that, but it would be actually possible via uh, isolation of these cells. So for instance, we isolated the endothelial cells in the first part of the, the talk, but we could also isolate astrocytes via like different markers and then look at what happens to GFAP expression if we have tumor cells in the system versus in a control system. But yeah, it is a great point and we haven't looked at that. Okay, and the third question, uh, very nice talk. Can you perfuse the microvascular network and show that there is capillary-like structure? How will perfusion affect the functional analysis? Yeah, that is a great point. And actually I can go back to, um, I think this one. So these images um, on the far right are actually perfused with IgG, fluorescent IgG. So this is what the perfused capillaries would actually look like at different time points. So for instance, here it's zero and 12 minutes. Um, how this would affect the functional analysis. So actually we use perfusion to be able to quantify permeability by looking at the fluorescent intensity in the vasculature versus outside the vasculature at two different time points. So that's basically the metric that we use. Um, how it would affect functional studies. Yeah, we haven't really looked at whether vascular structures that are perfused with a solute, what uh, the profile or, or gene expression profile of the endothelial cell looks like. Um, my suspicion is that if it's paracellular transport, so like small molecular weight dextran, it wouldn't really affect the endothelium. But if it were more specific, so for example, like a blocking antibody for a specific transporter or something like that, then yeah, it would definitely be blocking these receptors. So we would observe something different. But yeah, it's a great Thank question. You. All right, uh, another question. Uh, endothelial cells of the, of the BBB, this, uh, and the capillaries display heterogeneity. Do you, uh, does your in vitro system incorporate uh, this heterogeneity? Yeah, that is a great point. So actually in these studies, we worked with endothelial cells derived from iPS ECs, uh, sorry, from iPSCs, but we also compared these to primary brain endothelial cells. And so these ones are from companies uh, obtained basically from biopsies and isolation of endothelial cells. So technically they would have some level of heterogeneity because they come from patients. But yeah, the system would be able to capture this maybe perhaps using more genetic engineering tools so that we really ensure that we're incorporating two different populations in the system initially. But there are, um, like there is a likelihood that one population would dominate over the other. So it really depends on their ability to form vascular structures in 3D. Okay. All right, Cynthia, that was a great talk. Thank you so Thank much you for that. Much. You were you were spot on time and uh, everything is going really smoothly. The only thing that's a little weird is that we don't see the audience, which I always find a little disconcerting, but that's the way it is. That's the, this is our world for a, for a few more weeks. All right, thank you very much. Let's let's thank, thank uh, Cynthia again for a great talk. Thanks. All right, uh, our I, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker today, uh, Santiago Correa. Uh, Santi received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Yale and his PhD in biological engineering from MIT, uh, where he was advised by Paula Hammond and worked to engineer nanoparticles for targeted deliver, delivery of therapeutics in ovarian cancer. Uh, Santiago is currently a postdoc at Stanford working with Eric Apple. He's working on self-assembling nanotechnologies to modulate uh, the immune system. 
uh, uh, Santi's work is, uh, has been very productive so far. He's, uh, it's led to four patent applications. He's produced a, a number of papers and journals, including PNAS, Science Translational Medicine, ACS Nano, and Journal of Controlled Release. He's received a number of awards, a Dean's Diversity Fellowship and a Limelson Presidential Fellowship at MIT, a Siebel Scholar Award, and an, F an F32. And of course, he's been chosen for uh, as a speaker today, as has Cynthia uh, for this symposium, and, and in Santiago's case, an, another uh, number of others as well. So please join me in welcome, welcoming uh, Santiago, and I'll turn the table, the table, the floor over to him. Can you hear me? Great. Thanks for that great introduction, and good morning, everyone from the West Coast. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking to you today about how I'm using self-assembled nanotechnologies for immunoengineering applications. Uh, but before we dive into the research, organizers asked us to share a little bit about ourselves and what we like to do outside of the lab. Uh, and so just to give you a brief recap of uh, sort of my life history, I was actually born in Medellin, Colombia. My family immigrated to the United States when I was just one year old. Um, but we brought with us uh, a lot of our culture, including our food. Uh, for those who haven't had a chance to try Colombian food, I uh, highly recommend it, especially if you can find a place that makes ajiaco, which is my favorite. Um, it's a chicken and potato based stew. We ended up settling uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and in Atlanta, uh, as you might expect, I was a nerdy kid uh, that really liked school. But outside of school, I had some, uh, some hobbies. I, I loved chess. And here I am uh, playing chess against my big brother, brother, David, you know, before Queen's Gambit made chess cool again. Uh, and I also uh, was uh, and continue to be uh, a lover of art. Uh, and this is one of my pencil drawings from high school when I was actually uh, considering whether or not I should go to art school instead of a, a more traditional university. In the end, I ultimately decided to uh, go to Yale and study biomedical engineering. While I was in Connecticut, I learned how to ski, which has become one of my favorite pastimes. Uh, I also picked up photography and I got used to the winters. And I got so used to the winters that I continued moving north. Uh, and did my PhD at MIT in biological engineering and Paula Hammond's group. Uh, while I was in my PhD, I learned how to cook for myself and generally uh, fend for myself as an adult. Uh, and that included learning how to braise, how to roast. And one of my favorite things uh, that I learned how to cook were traditional Spanish paellas, especially when you cook them outside in these giant pans. Eventually, life has, uh, brought me out to the West Coast. Uh, I'm at Stanford now in the Department of Material Science uh, in Eric Apple's group. While I've been out here, I've picked up more hobbies. I have uh, gotten very into yoga. I have uh, acquired many, many plants during this pandemic. And uh, most of all, I've picked up ceramics, which has been a really great way to continue having art be part of my life. Um, and that's a bit about me uh, and to pivot back over to research uh, for today. And so what I'll be talking to you about is how uh, we can use self-assembled nanomaterials uh, for a variety of biomedical applications, specifically for immunoengineering applications. And so uh, when I talk about self-assembled nanomaterials, I'm talking about uh, constructing these functional nanoscale constructs uh, through supermolecular interactions of molecular building blocks. And so when I talk about these interactions, these are non-covalent interactions that allow for the organized uh, formation of these uh, nanoparticles through uh, phenomena such as electrostatic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, post-guest interactions. And this was the focus of my PhD, uh, where uh, I studied layer by layer assembly in Paula Hammond's group. And so this uh, particular uh, approach is sort of taking things to an extreme in terms of uh, we can continue to add material onto nanoparticles through the stepwise addition of polymer layers. The end result is uh, that you're able to create a nanocomposite material that contains multiple functional materials, and that allows us to carry out a number of different uh, biomedical applications and makes these materials intrinsically multifunctional. Uh, as uh, these materials are quite useful, and you saw an example of them in Cynthia's talk, uh, but they are also quite challenging to make. And so for the first few years of my PhD, I actually focused on nanofabrication methods and improving the way that these materials are made. And so my first publication was on incorporating tangential flow filtration techniques into the uh, formation of these nanoparticles, which improved the speed of synthesis, the uh, uh, yields, and the throughput for LBL nanoparticle synthesis. I was able to use these improvements in uh, fabrication to create a small library of LBL nanoparticles 
to begin exploring different material properties and how they translated to biomedical uh, utilities like tumor targeting. And specifically, I discovered several uh, surface chemistries that allowed us to target nanoparticles to specific subcellular compartments within ovarian cancer. At the same time, I was really interested in furthering the um, utility of this technology for non-viral gene delivery. And so for that, I collaborated with a postdoc in the group to optimize the synthetic conditions for making uh, these sRNA carrying LVL nanoparticles. And what we ultimately found were optimized uh, buffer and salt conditions uh, that allowed for robust and reproducible uh, assembly of these materials with high encapsulation of sRNA, which led to improved uh, gene silencing efficacy in vivo. We took the lessons from both of these stories, the surface chemistry story and the uh, non viral gene delivery uh, story, to uh, a collaboration of Sangeeta Bhatia's group, where we uh, combined uh, the LBL nanoparticle platform with her lab's uh, biosensing technology to create a nanoferronostic material that both silent specific genes and was able to provide non invasive uh, uh, tumor detection. So that is one slide for about six years of work. And so just to lay that all out again in sort of a timeline, I essentially worked on nanofabrication of these nanocomposites that allowed me to explore the functionality of surface chemistry in different settings, which led to the identification of coatings for, uh, that were useful for specific biomedical applications like pharaonostics, immunotherapy, and gene therapy. Now in my postdoc, I'm actually looking at uh, uh, nanoparticles as building blocks in and of themselves. And so we're creating these hydrogels from nanoparticles uh, for a variety of local drug delivery applications. And I'm specifically using them for uh, local cancer immunotherapy. I'm also starting to look at ways to increase the functionality of these materials by engineering the nanoparticle building blocks and making them more multifunctional. So if we come back to that schema from before, uh, now not, we're not only thinking about the self-assembly of uh, molecular building blocks into these functional nanoscale constructs, we're thinking about ways of using those constructs as building blocks in themselves to create these nano to macro scale supermolecular assemblies. And since these assemblies are also uh, put together through non-covalent interactions, they often have very useful mechanical properties for macroscopic biomaterial. For example, they are usually shear thinning and self-healing, and that makes them injectable. And so this means that we are uh, in sort of an exciting period of time where there's a lot more opportunity to uh, uh, look at minimally invasive local drug delivery. And this is a lot of applications for uh, the clinic, but the application that I'm most excited in is cancer immunotherapy. And so for those who might not be as familiar with cancer immunotherapy, this is just a quick background slide on sort of a cancer immunity cycle. So this is the process through which your body's immune system learns to recognize and eliminate uh, tumor cells. And it begins with immunogenic uh, death of cancer cells, which releases antigens uh, into the environment. Those antigens are taken up by antigen presenting cells, a, sp a special class of immune cell that then traffics those antigens to nearby lymph nodes, where they then interact with other immune cells like T cells through a process called T cell priming. This leads to the activation of specific anti-cancer T cells, which then migrate into the bloodstream, navigate to tumor tissues, uh, enter those tissues, recognize cancer cells expressing those antigens and destroy them, thereby uh, restarting this entire cycle over again. And so the vision that I have for this kind of a materials approach is to use these injectable hydrogels to specifically start rewiring the uh, tumor microenvironments. And when I say the tumor microenvironment, I'm talking about the tumor itself and the tumor draining lymph nodes. And so the ways that this can occur is through release of uh, drugs from the hydrogel that start to rewire uh, what's happening in, uh, with these immunosuppressive pathways in the tumor. And also through the release of drugs that uh, help to make the sort of education of immune cells that occurs in the lymph nodes happen more efficiently. You can also use this material to recruit specific types of immune cells into this environment by strategically encapsulating particular chemokines. And so for today, what I'm going to focus on is how we're using this approach to deliver a class of drug known as CD40 agonists. It's an antibody-based drug that primarily acts on this step of antigen presentation and T-cell priming. It acts by supercharging APCs and makes them much more effective at uh, uh, engaging this T-cell priming. It also allows them to produce cytokines that keep the immune system uh, functioning uh, robustly uh, so that the tumor uh, can actually be rejected. 
So while this uh, drug is very potent and it's been around for some time and also been uh, going through clinical trials for some time, it has not yet uh, been approved. And one of our main reasons for this is that the way we normally administer this type of drug and this type of compound is through these intravenous infusions. And when you do something like that with a drug this potent, you end up activating the immune system throughout the entire body. This essentially overheats your immune system and leads to immune-related adverse effects. Also, because the immune cells that are activated by this antibody exist throughout your tissues, those uh, immune cells act as antigen sinks and make the pharmacokinetics of this antibody quite poor. These two things combined have led to uh, generally failures when this uh, antibody has been tested as a monotherapy um, using doses that are tolerable for patients. But there's renewed interest in this drug recently with the PRINCE trial and other uh, combination immunotherapy trials where it appears that using an immunostimulant like this could be essential for uh, increasing the amount or improving the sensitivity to other frontline uh, immunotherapies. So we wanted to see if our technology would be able to overcome some of these issues and make it easier to uh, use CD40 agonists, especially in the context of, con uh, of cancer immunotherapy. And so the technology that we're using in this uh, particular uh, project is uh, polymer nanoparticle hydrogels. And they're composed of a dodecyl modified hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose and a core shell nanoparticle made of uh, PEG PLA. And when you mix these two things together, they interact in a way that's reminiscent of sort of molecular Velcro. And so the polymer sticks onto the nanoparticle, but it's not a, uh, a covalent interaction. It can become uh, unstuck and then restick after uh, whatever is disrupting that interaction uh, is removed. Also, because this material is uh, mixed and formed under aqueous and mild conditions, we can incorporate sensitive cargo like biologics, like antibodies, simply by adding them in when we mix this uh, all together. And so our vision going uh, forward is to go away from this global immunostimulation paradigm that uh, immunotherapy and most cancer uh, therapies follow today, which is through uh, intravenous infusion of the drugs to something that's more localized. So the idea being that we can inject this hydrogel locally next to tumors, principally elevate the immune system in that environment and in the tumor draining lymph nodes and thereby spare uh, off target organs uh, exposure to these potent drugs and reduce side effects without compromising efficacy. And so to see if our technology could do this, we decided to look at how uh, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of CD40 agonists change when you administer them using a hydrogel. We wanted to compare them against sort of the next best thing, uh, which right now is just a local bolus injection of drugs. And so to look at the change in pharmacokinetics uh, quite quantitatively, we decided to do a PET imaging study, which we did in collaboration with the Gambier group at Stanford. Uh, for this, we injected radio-labeled CD40 agonists, either as a hydrogel or as a local bolus, next to B16 F10 melanoma tumors in mice. Uh, we imaged mice every day for 12 days uh, and collected that data to see how biodistribution was being impacted by hydrogel administration. And this is just a representative image of uh, 24 hours after administration. Warmer colors indicate higher concentrations of antibody. And so you can see uh, essentially in the local bolus case, we're already seeing high levels of antibody accumulating the spleen, the heart, and distant lymphatics. In contrast, when we look at a hydrogel, almost all of the antibody is still retained in the injection site. Uh, and we're seeing very, very low levels of antibody accumulating in these off-target organs. When we look at this a bit more quantitatively over the course of an entire 12-day study uh, and uh, essentially calculate the changes in exposure due to having used a hydrogel, we see that hydrogel is essentially increased exposure in only two places, the injection site and the tumor draining lymph node, which in this case was the ipsilateral inguinal lymph node. Everywhere else, we're actually decreasing exposure and often significantly increasing it. So having confirmed that hydrogels are going to confer a benefit to pharmacokinetics that go beyond what you would see with just a local bolus, we wanted to see how that would impact pharmacodynamics, specifically how would it affect toxicity and how would it affect efficacy? So to look at this, we decided to see what was happening with cytokines. As you can, uh, might remember, one of the things that this antibody does is that it causes APCs to produce cytokines that are uh, immunostimulatory. That can be great in the tumor microenvironments, but if it happens in systemic circulation, it can lead to very difficult uh, uh, toxicities for patients. 
And so what we did is uh, we looked one day after treatment at the blood uh, with a Luminex cytokine panel uh, to see what was happening with toxicity. And then three days later, we looked at what was happening in the tumor draining lymph node, also with a Luminex cytokine panel to assess what was happening in terms of uh, efficacy or uh, a metric that could indicate efficacy. And so here I'm showing uh, just a subset of our results, uh, three uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, and IL-12. These are very, very potent cytokines, and when they're at high levels in circulation, they can lead to serious toxicities. And so here we have uh, four groups. Uh, we have our isotype control, so we'll think of this as our baseline, uh, what the cytokine levels would be normally. Then we have uh, sort of a clinical standard. So this would be the systemic administration of a maximum tolerated dose, which in this case is five micrograms of CD40 agonists. So higher than this indicates a more toxic treatment than the uh, maximum tolerated dose. And so when we explored higher doses in the local setting, uh, looking at 10 micrograms dose, we saw that local bolus consistently led to higher levels of systemic uh, cytokines compared to sort of this clinical standard, indicating that it was causing more toxicity than uh, what you would normally see uh, in sort of a clinical setting. Uh, in contrast, when we look at the hydrogel, the hydrogel is able to mitigate the amount of cytokine that's being induced significantly across these three cytokines, indicating that this is actually uh, more tolerable than sort of the clinical standard approach. When we look at what's happening in the tumor draining lymph node, we see the opposite story. Now, three days later, we're seeing actually that uh, systemic administration is leading to almost no upregulation of effector cytokines. Here, we're looking at interferon gamma, IL-15, uh, and CXCL-10. So IL-15 is important for T-cell function. CXCL-10 is a uh, potent chemokine. Uh, and interferon gamma is, is a potent uh, pro-inflammatory signaler. Um, this result is not terribly surprising because, as you might recall, uh, monotherapy of CD40 at these um, lower doses tends not to be effective. But when we look at the higher dose administered locally, either with a local bolus or a hydrogel, we see higher cytokine levels of tumor draining lymph node. And the hydrogel seem to drive this um, even further than a local bolus, which could be because these materials are sustaining the release of the antibody over time. To look at whether this uh, would actually lead to changes in efficacy, we conducted a survival study in the B16F10 model again. Uh, and so this is a melanoma model that normally responds quite poorly to immunotherapy. And we first wanted to compare how local bolus and hydrogel delivery of this higher dose uh, would lead to changes in efficacy. And so after a single administration of uh, CD40 agonists, either as a local bolus or as a hydrogel, we saw that the hydrogel uh, group uh, saw slower growth of their tumors and enjoyed a moderate survival benefit, with one mouse actually um, becoming a long-term survivor. In contrast, the same amount of drug, but administered as a local bolus, led to um, results similar to our negative isotype control. Since this drug is uh, specifically quite interesting for combination immunotherapies, uh, we also wanted to look at how it might synergize with checkpoint inhibition. And so here we're combining it with pdl one blockade, which helps to prevent negative signals to T cells. And you can see in the black line, um, pdl one blockade by itself uh, does not lead to any long-term survivors. In the dark blue line, CD40 um, by itself in a hydrogel leads to one long-term survivor again in this study. But when we combine local regional CD40 agonism with pdl one we see that in both administration routes, we get 40% long-term survivor. Uh, this combined with our observations of improved safety in the hydrogel uh, condition uh, gives us a lot of uh, hope for this material being useful for uh, incorporating these potent kinds of drugs uh, in the future. Just to sort of summarize this, this work, essentially what we found is that nanoparticle hydrogels are able to focus uh, antibody exposure on target tissues specifically in a way that's improved from uh, local bolus injection. This led to changes in uh, the compartments of the body where we saw induction of cytokines. In particular, we saw fewer uh, cytokines being induced systemically, which uh, leads to less toxicity. And we saw elevated cytokines induced in the tumor draining lymph node, which uh, increases the efficacy of a treatment. And when we looked at uh, uh, pure efficacy metrics, we saw that hydrogels improve outcome in monotherapy settings, and that local regional therapy in general synergizes strongly with pdl one checkpoint blockade. So to round things out with a little bit of a future-looking uh, focus, 
I'm now looking at uh, a research program that pulls together my doctoral and postdoctoral experience. So as you might recall, my uh, PhD was all about developing these highly multifunctional nanocomposites. And my postdoc has been all about using nanoparticles as building blocks for larger materials. And what I'm interested in doing now is uh, focusing on the nanoparticle building, uh, building block part of this equation and essentially engineering these uh, nanomaterials to confer uh, previously inaccessible functionalities in bulk macroscopic biomaterials, specifically greater control um, over the timing and the spatial organization of bio, uh, biological cues from these materials, and also ways to incorporate cell-derived nanomaterials into hydrogel scaffolds. Uh, in general, the idea here is to create more biomimetic materials that could be useful for uh, addressing outstanding uh, challenges uh, such as immunoengineering, but also to help answer some fundamental biological questions as well. And so with that, I would just like to uh, recognize and thank my uh, previous groups and mentors, the Hammond group at MIT, uh, which has was just super fantastic, Paula Hammond, who is just an extraordinary mentor, um, and my postdoctoral group at uh, Stanford, the Apple group, who's been, been so much fun uh, to work with, and in particular, Eric, uh, my postdoctoral mentor, who's just been ter terrific throughout this entire process, as well as our collaborators at MIT, the Batia and Irvine groups, and our collaborators at uh, Stanford, the Gambier and Ido Yaga Labs. And so with that, I'd like to take any questions. All right, Santi, thank you very much. Uh, what, a, what a great talk. We've already got a, a, a lot of questions. I, I'm going to start representing the naive uh, portion of our audience and, and ask you, you know, you, you saw what appeared in terms of the systemic um, uh, immune uh, overreaction, you, you saw something like a 30%, 35% reduction. Can you imagine that, that, that you could get that systemic reaction down further? And how might, how might you go, go about that, right? What everybody's looking for is the perfect therapy that doesn't make us sick, right? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I've been very interested in. So uh, the material that uh, I used for this particular study, uh, it essentially relied on, on passive uh, release mechanisms for antibody. And so although this material does allow for a pretty slow release of antibody over time, uh, what I think would make this um, even safer would be to the incorporation of infinity uh, governed release mechanisms. And that's actually something that I'm currently looking at um, in terms of engineering our nanoparticles to have sort of uh, it's not a specific interactions of our cargo to further regulate and slow down release. Okay, fantastic. All right, we'll start with the submitted questions. We have several of them. Um, uh, nice talk. Could you elaborate on the chemical design of LBL technology that can promote release of surface loads at the wanted sites? So the release of surface loads. Uh, so I'll, I believe that that is probably with reference to drugs encapsulated into the layers of the system. And so uh, the chemical formula, could you repeat the question actually? Sure. Uh, repeat, uh, can you elaborate on the chemical design that can promote the release of surface loads at wanted sites? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the uh, surface chemistries that we found uh, that allow us to sort of deliver our drugs more in a more targeted way, include the polyaspartic uh, coating, which allowed for uh, initial binding to the, uh, to the cell membrane and then eventual caviolar uptake. Uh, and so in that setting, we have a material that uh, will have, uh, so in the nanoferronostic setting, uh, we have this sensor on the surface of a material that interacts with extracellular uh, proteases. And so that particular chemistry allows for that interaction, provides enough time for that interaction to occur. And then the caviolar uptake allows for us to eventually deliver the nucleic uh, acids, the siRNAs in the material um, when it's internalized. Uh, we also discovered a polyglutamic acid coating, which is uh, quite similar to aspartic acid, but doesn't really mediate internalization. And so for that, we were able to uh, uh, use for targeted delivery of cytokines. And so uh, you can imagine our uh, particle would stick onto the surface of cancer cells and then stay there and release or present uh, IL-12 over time. I like to think of this as sort of painting these cancer cells with an immunostimulatory material, um, which then would stimulate the nearby immune cells uh, by those uh, cancer cells. That's kind of the two, uh, my two favorite chemistries that came out of that study, um, but happy to talk about other chemistries as well. Okay, thank you. 
uh, we have several questions about the uh, about the materials. So, uh, what's happening physically to the to the material? Is it, it, it you know what and is it staying together, falling apart? How does it affect the clearing? Yeah. So the uh, PMP hydrogel material actually uh, sticks around in the body for a good amount of time, um, but you can tune it basically by the percent solids of the material. And so our, our typical uh, formulation that we use for drug delivery applications is 2% by weight HPMC and 10% uh, by weight uh, PEG-PLA nanoparticle. And that will typically last uh, two to three weeks uh, in the body. Um, and we've also explored formulations where we are delivering cells and material. And so for that, we actually use somewhat softer materials that are 1% HPMC and 5% nanoparticles. And those tend to clear up within one to two weeks. Um, and essentially what we've seen in terms of a reaction to the material is a relatively robust infiltration of cells. Uh, and our going theory is essentially that the material is slowly being uh, consumed by uh, myeloid cells over time and eventually just uh, dissipates. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Um, I'm going to uh, skip down to another question about the hydrogel. So, what what are the general what's the general immune response to the hydrogel, and do you find immune cells uh, in and around the eject, injected uh, cell in, in hydrogel in, in in response to that? Any immune response? Yeah, beautiful question. Uh, this is something that we've been looking at uh, somewhat, ex starting to look at it much more seriously, but have looked at a bit so far. And so we've evaluated this material as a way to deliver vaccines. Uh, and we've seen that uh, essentially the cell infiltrates that you uh, find in the material depend strongly on what's encapsulated within the hydrogel. So the hydrogel by itself will recruit a specific kind of portfolio of immune cells, but that portfolio will change quite a bit depending on whether you have an adjuvant or antigen or other kind of drug in, in, the, uh, drug, in the material. And so uh, for us, that's exciting because it feels like we can sort of engineer this immunogenic cell niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to do some conduct some studies now, in particular using codex te techniques um, to see what these immune cells are doing and how they're spatially organized within the material and to what extent we can tune that with the cargo that we're encapsulating. Okay, terrific. Uh, a question about uh, the, uh, let's see, the profile of immune cells. So apart from analyzing the cytokines, did you observe any differences in the profile of immune cells recruited to or, or residing at the tumor site? Yeah, that's actually, so that, uh, those experiments are sort of pen, uh, still pending. So we've uh, not done those studies with the CD40 agonist delivery uh, yet, but it's something I'm quite interested in. Yeah, okay, terrific. Okay, uh, a question about uh, metastasization. Uh, so most of the malignant tumors are detected in advanced stages. Have you examined how efficient this local immunostimulation will be in inducing remissions in, in metastatic tumors. That's a hard, that's a hard problem, right? <laughs> it is a hard problem, uh, but it is something we have looked at. Uh, so one of the main ideas here is that if you can mount an effective immune response locally, it should lead to systemic, uh, a systemic response that should have um, what's called the abs abscopal effect. So uh, inhibitory effects on distant untreated tumors. And we have conducted a model study uh, with, with our material. So we had a uh, experiment where we had mice that had two tumors and we treated one tumor, not the other. And we saw that the CD40 hydrogels were able to slow down growth of both uh, tumors, which was promising. Uh, and beyond our own work, there's a good amount of, um, of, of data, specifically uh, Jean Gu's lab at UCLA, has uh, lots of data indicating that local immunotherapy of one tumor can lead to abscopal inhibitory effects on distant and untreated tumors. Fantastic. That's, a, that's actually a more optimistic answer than I was expecting to tell you the truth. Uh, I'm glad to hear it. Okay, so um, uh, a technical question here. How did you measure local cytokine levels? Yeah, so for the uh, for that particular uh, study, we extracted the tumor lymph node, homogenized it, uh, and essentially lysed the cells using uh, sort of a kit from Thermo to sort of uh, typically for Western, but um, that we cleared with our immune phenotyping core. Uh, and then they performed uh, the Luminex cytokine panel on that, uh, on that lysate. Okay. And um, uh, the last question in the q and is, a, is, a, is um, thinking about other applications, I think. Can you print 
in these kinds of materials to make more elaborate structures? Yeah, uh, the answer is you can. Uh, so this is something that we are exploring a little bit, uh, especially with some of the new materials that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so we recently, I recently have been working on uh, um, a liposome-based hydrogel, uh, and we've been exploring this capability. I would say it's possible, but the main limitation right now is that uh, the supermolecular system uh, in these 3D uh, printed uh, conditions normally, which would be like in aqueous conditions, eventually you'll see erosion. And so you can print something, but it's going to sort of just flow away or dissolve away. And so what we've, um, what we're looking at right now is ways to introduce a secondary network for uh, a covalent secondary network uh, to form, to stabilize the structure after you printed it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, what a great, uh, what a great start to this uh, exciting uh, series. We're spot on time, great questions, great answers. I want to uh, thank uh, Santi and Cynthia again for terrific talks and for their time. And thank you all for your time. And we'll be seeing you all uh, uh, soon for the next iteration of this wonderful event. Take care.